All right, guys, I want to welcome everybody out to another Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson podcast. Today we have a pretty awesome guest on our show here, a guest that I never really ever anticipated showing up here because he's from Florida, and I wasn't going to bring all my stuff out there, but he had kind of a, a special task today, uh, or the past few days, actually. But um, yeah, I'm sitting here with my co-host, Andrew, here, and uh, we want to welcome out Josh, a.k.a. the Shade Tree Surgeon. What's up, Josh? How are you? Doing well and feeling fine. I love it, man. You came out here uh, on kind of a, a funny thing. You know, obviously, a lot of you that watch the channel know that I've been doing some stuff with uh, Million Dollar Bogan, you know, Danny Hayes, and he has his trek. You know, he, he just got back from South America again doing the Bolivian Death Road. And before he went down there, we did an overhaul on his Road King. And somehow that bike ended up in your, your hands, right? <laughs> so, what happened was is he had to ship it to Miami instead of out here, and so he called me up, and I've known him for years just through the, just through YouTube. You know, you get to know people, you end up knowing people, you talk, and you know them for years, even though I've met him and never met him in real life. I consider him a friend, you know? and yeah. so he called me up and he says, "Hey, I have to ship my back to Miami. I don't know anybody else in Florida." I said, "Will you pick it up?" I said, "No problem." And so I went down to Miami, and Danny's a weird cat uh, because there was. Like, there, he gave me, emailed me, like, some EPA thing that allows it to be in the United States. And then he also just made a video of him looking at the camera and going, yes, I'm Daniel Hayes, and uh, I give, and he got my name wrong, which is not weird, because people know me as Shade Tree, but he's yeah. just like, and I give uh, uh, J- Jonathan, uh, J- J- Jason, I know him as Shade Tree. I give, he has permission to pick up the bike. It's totally okay. And I'm just looking at, I didn't even say anything to him because I'm just looking at this video that he sent me going like, what the, like, do you want to tie yourself up to? Like, what am I supposed to <laughs> show this to the, the, the port authority, to the <laughs> customs and be like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's so fine. I was you like, said whatever, so. dude. And I was like, whatever. So we went down there and I went with my friend Alex, diplomat, uh, amazing dude, awesome channel, a uh, very good friend of mine because he speaks the language. Just like out here, you go someplace like Miami, it's like going to the, a border town. If you don't speak Spanish... You're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anywhere, dude. <laughs> so we go down there. I try to get the bike. I said, I'm going to pick up the motorcycle. And I gave it. Because I was trying to just, you know, give them a little shuck and jive right off the I'm here to pick up the motorcycle. And they know immediately because, like, there's only one motorcycle. They're like, oh, yeah, the motorcycle. Are you, you know, they're talking to Alex or Daniel Hayes. I'm like, no. no but you got I'm a not. video. But I didn't show the video. I'm like, <laughs> ah. it's my, I, but I have permission. It's okay. And they're back and forth. I'm like, no. It's, and just you keep saying that. And eventually they're like, well, we can't give it to you. You have to go see customs. They go see customs. They don't want nothing to do with it. They're like, well, if you have a power of attorney, then maybe. Mm. So let me tell you what 100 bucks <laughs> and a will to get something done gets done in Miami. You can <laughs> find someone to put their stamp that gives you power of attorney over somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. Really I was the, like, rubber, oh. the rubber stamp of power. Yeah. So yeah. someone put a stamp on it. I went back, and I never even went back to customs. I just go, "Hey, look, I got it here. We talked here. This is all fine." And I'm just like going back and forth, and eventually, through Alex, everyone was just so frustrated that they're just like, "Take it," and they wouldn't even unload it out of the building. They just left it in the building. I saw you uncrating it. We the- had to uncrate it yeah. in the building, and I wrote it off the loading dock. Interesting. Um, and then we just left. Throughout no point in this entire procedure did anybody actually look at my ID. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we wow. just left. So that was the really crazy thing about riding here to California. Is I had uh, was just like, yeah. I hope I don't get pulled over because I have no way to prove that I'm allowed to have this motorcycle whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> except for a video on your cell phone. Yeah, but you got damn, be like, uh, Jonathan, it's so totally. I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> You got YouTube. <laughs> Show me your YouTube profile. I, I love that uh, that uh, and you've hung out with him, and uh, I just feel like it says a lot about him that he was just like, "This will be okay." You know, I, I don't know if it's the credibility that comes with like your subscriber count or what, or maybe it's just the the YouTube community. Like, because I mean, in the in the Harley Davidson YouTube community, it's it's pretty tight knit. You know, there's not a whole lot of people, and so. It's almost like this immediate trust factor that's just built in. At least that's how I felt with Danny, and that's kind of how I feel with you. Not that I'm letting you take my bike across the country or anything, but oh, I feel sure, like I will. <laughs> <laughs> that was that wasn't an yeah. offer. Maybe in the future, who yeah, knows? Yeah. But um, I could just take it too. Do you keep your key in the saddlebag? You got yeah. the fob in the saddlebag? <laughs> I bet you do. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but not uh, anymore now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm going to change that real quick. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's interesting how he just blindly trusted you. I mean, I'm assuming you guys had never met in person, just no, like never. online. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Well, anyways, you're here. You yes. had a little bit of a cold ride, I think, is what you said earlier. It was a uh, just um, offensive is the word I would use. <laughs> I've never been that cold in my life, but the body has a way of forgetting things. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, I had a bad problem with that girl, but all of a sudden, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'm like, let me try again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Your body has a funny way of forgetting stuff and a great way of telling stories. You know, I read something a long time ago that said that people have um, a better time planning a trip than they do on the trip. That's interesting. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's because sometimes the trip sucks, but you got to embrace the suck and the suck is what makes it fun. So what I'll do through a trip is I'll just like think about after the trip, I'll be like, I can barely tell this story. But once I got to California, everything was great. So all I did was think about how I'm going to tell the story, but you don't get to tell the story unless you took the trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's just yeah. weird the way it works together. Yeah. But yeah, it was hard and it was hard, but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I know what it's like to ride through very cold weather it was multiple thousands of miles um, through 29 degree weather. The highest it got was 37, mm. and uh, I will tell you, it just sucks Jeez. the life out of you, man. And uh, just like just the pain, like uh, every single finger just is. And I also just wasn't prepared. I mean, I had like a rain jacket over a hoodie, and then just leather gloves. Yeah. And then with like, I found I went to Walmart and got like some thinner gloves that would fit inside the leather gloves. Yeah, yeah. And that was all I had, and then just like my boots and. My cowboy boots and jeans. Yeah. And so, well, like, we have holes in them. So, I was like, I was not prepared. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it. Yeah, once you get into the 30s, that's that's dangerous territory. And it's funny with you, what you say about trips, and it's fun to plan them, and then afterwards it's fun to talk about them, the good yeah. times and everything. We went on a trip recently to Tombstone, and it was cold. It wasn't in the 30s. Uh, it may have dipped down in the night in the 30s, but we were all pretty dang prepared. And um, Huge advocate of the heated clothing, my friend. So I think maybe I, in next the future. Time, dude, next <laughs> time. What I would do is um, I would always look for a Love's gas station because Love's gas stations always have a heated hand dryer. So when you get cold, you can't come back from that. It's a war of attrition. You never get warmer. You only get colder. You can only stop how fast you get cold. Like you're not getting warmer if you're in the element still. Yeah, like exactly. It's only down. Yep. So what I would do is I would find it. I would be like, all right, love. So I pull over and I go in there because your hands are the worst because there's no meat on them. It's just bone, sinew, muscle. Like there's no, there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had frostbite before on my last trip because I didn't do this. So you, I had secondary secondary frostbite. Oh. You ever mow the lawn and then you like you poke your hand and you, and you feel like the buzz vibrate through your hand? Yeah. yeah. So I thought I after I got off the trip I had that for. But for like three and a half months, jeez. So that's scary. I was like, I did not want that to happen again. Whatever. I, did, I went to the doctor. They're like, it'll go away. I'm like, right, cool. It wasn't that. It wasn't that bad. My fingers weren't black. Like, okay. You could not see anything bad. I just like they were numbish. The nerves were probably dead or something. Um, and it came back completely. And I was like, I don't want that to happen again though. So I, whenever I found a loves, I went in and I put my hands on the heated hand dryer and I completely re- reset them back to warm again. Mm-hmm. And then I would go like another hundred miles, and they're just they feel like ice, they like nothing from here down. Just like can't feel any finger. I find another loves and heat them up again, and they feel fine. I like I don't have it. Like they don't feel numb at all. So it worked. Who needs heated gear? <laughs> <laughs> Me, I want it next time I do. I'm not doing that again without heated gear. Yeah, you adapt and survive, man. That's awesome. Uh, adapt, adapt or perish, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of the guy you are, Shay Tree. And I, we talked a little bit downstairs, but um, so I think maybe we'll re- repeat the conversation we had, but. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about how I feel like you're one of the original YouTubers covering cruiser content on YouTube. And I, I think I probably started watching your content about 10 years ago, I feel like. And I just really weird because I started watching your content when you were still making dirt bike videos. <laughs> so if you go back and sort through Matt Laidlaw's content and go from oldest to newest, you'll see what I'm talking about. You got to dig for those, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you really got to dig. They're still out there, dude. <laughs> But, um, I, yeah, I just remember uh, watching, there was, like, an intro to one video of some girl saying, like, I want to learn how to wheelie or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and, Cammy. Uh, okay. Still on the channel. Cammy okay. Is. Okay, yeah. I, I've seen Cammy recently. Yeah. That's the same girl, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is that, like, your, your girlfriend or just a friend that's a female or? Let me tell you something about me, Matt. Okay. I don't have a girlfriend. Okay. All right. 
That's why I ask. But I know a few girls might be real mad they heard me say that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Keep it real, dude. Yeah, Hubble, <laughs> Luckily, they don't watch a whole lot of YouTube. <laughs> Probably don't watch and listen to my podcast. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, so it was, it was like the thing that struck me about you immediately was just here's a guy that is just making things happen, writing whatever he can get his hands on, uh, not loyal to any brand, just writing, and obviously a love for Harley Davidson, which is mm-hmm. why you're here right now, but also a love for all, all brands, two wheels. And now I watch your content and it's just like, I've got this project bike, I've got that project bike. Uh, this is a bike that I have torn down to the frame that I have all these memories on. Um, how would you describe yourself like as a YouTuber? Like what, what, if you were, if you were to say, Hey, I produce X, Y, Z content, what would that content be? Um, I'm really just, I'm just trying to have a good time, man. And, um, YouTube makes, I think that YouTube makes you have a good time. makes you have a better time than you would. It makes you do things you wouldn't normally do. Mm -hmm. Uh, your recent trip to, to the, to the town, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that was so well edited, by the way, that was so great. Thanks, man. Um, would you have, you might've done that. You know, but would you really have? Would you have done it in that way? So YouTube makes you do things you wouldn't normally do because you do it for the video. Now that's a that's a weird. There's a there's a Venn diagram happening there because you would say, well, I don't want to make any content that I wouldn't make regardless. I don't want to make a video, make any video that I wouldn't do without the camera. But also, I'm making it because I'm making the video, and it makes me do things I wouldn't normally do. So you get that common thing when people tell you like, well, you're just doing it for the video. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> of course I am. You're welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm having a really great time. And I would have never done this if I didn't have a camera in my hand. Yeah. So it's always just been the pursuit of fun, the pursuit of what ne- what's next, the pursuit of um, what weird thing can I do and experience have fun. Even this ride across the country now, even though it was a, a lot to do with because, like I talked to you earlier about making this funny video about stealing Danny's bike and taking it to Mexico. And that was really fun because I got to – you know, live out this weird 90s wrestling heel <laughs> fantasy where I get to be the bad guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it was also, like, I knew it was going to be cold, and I wanted to experience it. Otherwise, why would you do that? Why would you subject yourself to going 2,000 miles with weather in the high 20s and low 30s? You'd never do that. You'd be like, nah, man, I'm, I'm going to wait. Yeah. Wait five days or something like that. But I did it. So I know what it's like. I wanted, I wanted to know what it's like. I wanted to know what it's like to experience that. I wanted to know what it's like to go through that. And I wanted to know how I felt. There was times at night, like one time I was coming out of Louisiana to Texas. This was probably the coldest it ever was. And it started raining mm. on top of it, and just which is awful. You know, it's terrible. And I got lost going to the hotel, and it's pitch black. And my visor's fogged, and I'm just like in some small town that doesn't have a name going through like neighborhoods of houses. Cause I'm like, I'm like, I don't know where I'm going trying to find some hotel. And I had this, just this overwhelming feeling of looking while I'm riding the motorcycle, looking inside people's houses with the lights on. And I got this overwhelming urge to break into somebody's house just to be warm. <laughs> like I was just like, you could just go in there, you know? So you're pretty desperate and you know, not so <laughs> overwhelming that I was like, I couldn't even think about it critically as it was happening. Like, I was just like, ooh, that's a weird feeling. <laughs> yeah. I've never felt that one before. Yeah. And so I like that. I like to feel things that I've never felt before. Did you and act on that feeling or no? No, I found the hotel. Okay. <laughs> Luck- yeah. Luckily for all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Although that would have made a really great story for them that they would have never experienced if I hadn't started making YouTube videos. There you go. <laughs> oh. <Absolutely. laughs> but no, I found a hotel. But it's just a, how do you ever put yourself in a situation like that? without this need not need to make videos but it's like i'm making the video i want to do i want to do this it's the reason it's not the reason it's a byproduct it's everything at once man and uh we're still in such the infancy of both um social media just gets it's such a bad word right but only because people use it as a catch-all to describe things that they don't like about it yeah, true. Uh, it, it, YouTube and and video creation is such in its infancy. And I mean, I loved movies. You had a lot of movies. You guys like movies. Yeah, Everyone likes movies. Grew right? up on movies. I was an eighties, nineties kid. Yes, so. yes. The nineties were the 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 nineties were the seventies of movies. Yeah, the nineties was a wild time in movies. Like you look at it, like a Quentin Tarantino movie. Like you think that could have ever gotten released. Now and that's okay that it couldn't because things go through phases. Mm-hmm. That was the same thing in the seventies. There's a ton of movies in the seventies that were just pushing boundaries, wild, dialogue-driven, insane stuff that could never get released. Now the nineties was like that. 
yeah. you grew up on that stuff. And I would just like the dollar theater was our babysitter over the summer. <laughs> so we just saw every movie over and over and over again. And I always was like, I wanted to be a director until I saw Pulp Fiction. <laughs> and then I realized I was never going to be a director. Yeah, I just remember going like written, directed by Quentin Tarantino. And I remember going like, how did he think of so many words? Because <laughs> of the dialogue, you know what I mean? Like yeah, the dialogue, yeah. and it was insane. But I always wanted to make videos. Mm-hmm. And so what really got me into that too, I don't know if I'm going off on a tangent here. That I don't know. Like, but uh, what really got me into that after movies, and I always wanted to be, I would always like think like, oh, if I made a movie, it'd be like this. and make it in my head and stuff like that, or make music videos in my head to songs when I hear them on the radio. But what really made me think it was possible, because after I saw movies that were actually good, when I say good, I use that. I like a lot of schlocky movies too, but when I started really getting into, you know, into films, <laughs> I, and I realized, like, oh, these guys are like... Cinema. Be- yes, these guys are so much better than me. Like, I don't have the brain power to make something like this, which is okay. It wasn't upsetting. I just was like a realization. Uh, but then, you know, I started ordering like CKY videos at the back of Thrasher magazine, you know, and just like ordering all these like yes. VHS tapes and crusty demons of dirt yeah. and like all, all this stuff that you could get out of the back of magazines. And I was like, these guys are making videos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're making their own videos. Yeah. Like I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> the skate videos. It's, yes, it's dude. so funny skate you videos. say this because yeah, like, like, a lot of that is my inspiration and in, like, I feel like some of my creative direction when I make videos too. Like I grew up on Krusty Demons of Dirt mm-hmm. and like watching Travis Pastrana when he was 16, hucking all kinds of crazy moves and stuff yeah. like that. And um, you know, just a lot of the way the music, I mean, yeah. movies are made a little bit now. They're not as like your cookie cutter stereotypical movies. Like directors are trying to be different now. But if you go back to the 80s and 90s, they all kind of followed the same formula in a sense. And I feel like I use that formula in some of like my trip videos just the way the music comes in and the climax yeah. and the end and the and the the credits, you know. And so it's interesting to hear you talk about it because I feel like we, you know, we're about the same age. We yeah. kind of grew up during the same time. And so I feel like some of our inspiration was drawn from the same Just things. wanted to make movies, man. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, well how right. it was so incorporated with music, you know. Like I grew up watching skate videos and I'd watch a skate video and it was always incorporated with punk or something like that. And you, it just pumps you up and it motivates a kid like me, and a, uh, you know, being a teenager, you know, I want a Panasonic, a Panasonic camera with a fisheye lens, and just yeah, go yeah. wreck the streets, you know, <laughs> like. And then you incorporate cool music into it, and you share it with your friends, and it just kind of snowballs from there. But you know, the, yeah. the the early days of that was just so cool, you know. And Those were my first v- YouTube videos, which I wish I hadn't deleted. When mm-hmm. I re- when I first realized how to make like a channel, I realized like a channel was a thing. Yeah. Because before it's like YouTube was like photo bucket with videos. You yeah. Know? Yep. Or that's how I thought of it. I was just yeah. like, oh, I made, th- I have this video, and I just like no editing. I just like upload it. Yep. You know, and you remember back in that YouTube had an editor in, yep. in where you upload it, right? And yep. so like I would be like, okay, I can cut off a little bit, but I didn't really mess with it that much. And it was all just I like I told you earlier, it was hunting videos and, um, just and these were all actually recorded on VHS, but like the little ones. Remember those? Mm-hmm. So I had a video camera. I had took the little VHS that you put in the big VHS mm-hmm. tape, mm-hmm. and then we got our first computer that had like the thing where you could put a VHS tape on the computer as a video file. And that was all my first YouTube videos. Interesting. Um, and, and so I deleted everything when Shoot, I was man. like, I was going to go like, oh, I'm going to make like, I'm going to change it from what was like my AOL user na- AIM username. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to change it into Shade Tree Surgeon. And now it's going to be a whole thing. Like, all this other stuff is gone. Now it's just motorcycle videos, which I still really enjoy. But it's like, God, I wish I still had those because I forget even what they look like sometimes. It would know? have been YouTube gold, man. Now, my, like, you know. post right now, my first video, post that up. Yeah, and yeah. Have you out there hunting or something like even that? Even my first video was pretty. We used to do stuff like, I was like, oh, we'll be like, do. I would like hold the camera and we had a shotgun and we'd go and just like shoot. We'd, throw stuff on the ground and shoot it like it was a first person shooter and like <laughs> yeah. we had like hunting four wheelers and we how we like dressing deers and and just like you know kid shit you know yeah yeah, yeah. hillbilly and, stuff man. yeah yeah <laughs> i love it i mean I, i've realized now like especially riding through arizona and uh west texas i am a city boy I am not a country boy. <laughs> not at wow, all. They're dude. even more country than you out there, yeah. huh? <laughs> I just look at that. I'm like, I look around. I go, they paint the houses the same color as the dirt. <laughs> I'm like, what? 
<laughs> what? Like, what are you doing, dude? It's like, it's just like nothing but brown dirt. And then you're just like, is that a, lo- no, that's a house. And you painted this. I'm like, I don't want to live out. That takes a hard motherfucker to live out there, dude. Absolutely. I'm just looking at that brown, flat dirt with Mount. I'm just like, this you going to be hard to live out there. <laughs> the, the, the hills will, have eyes stuff, Yeah, right? dude, I like being able to go to Fresh Market and get my freaking boba tea, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're so bougie, man. <laughs> I like nice things. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot we have to cover, so let's move on. Shade Tree Surgeon, how did you come up with that name? I've heard it before, but... I certainly don't mind telling it again. Okay. I've gotten good enough at telling a story that I can, for brevity's sake, I'll keep okay. it kind of brief. Okay. So when I was a young man, um, when I say young man, like 17, 18 years old, uh, didn't have a great relationship with my father. And so I just became obsessed with manhood rituals from other cultures and stuff like that. This was like the late 90s, early 2000s when the whole body modification scene was really big. Like Steve Hayworth was doing a lot of weird stuff out of Arizona and BME zine was a thing. And Anyway, um, so I got it in my head and I'd already had some tattoos and some piercings. And I got it in my head that I had to split my own tongue in order to go become a man, right? This is my manhood ritual because I never got a manhood ritual because my dad sucked or something. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. It's yeah, typical stuff. Shit, you got you know? to split your tongue. It's pretty normal, yeah, right? 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 But I just like I get, I'm got convinced myself. Dude. I'm just like this is it has to be it has to be this, and so I so I did it and I read how to do it online. I actually printed the instructions <laughs> from the Peninsular Library in South Tampa, Tampa, Florida. <laughs> Uh, and I printed them off, and I followed them exactly, and I pierced my tongue, and uh, I stretched it up to a four gauge, and then what you do is you thread fishing line through, and you tie it down as tight as it will go, uh. which is much tighter than you think. Um, so if you imagine, you ever, you guys ever fish? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love to fish, man. So you ever get some fishing line, you pull it, and it gets around your finger mm-hmm. hard, like, like I'm talking about like 15-pound test, you know? Yeah, Not cut. big stuff. Yeah, it you're cuts. like, ooh, yeah. that's bad. Mm-hmm. As tight as I could get it without breaking it. And then knotted it down so it stayed there. And then the next morning, which is horrendously painful, the next morning, another piece, as tight as it will go on top of it. Uh, you were supposed to take 30 days to do it. I did mine in seven. Ooh. Um, because I was like, oh, I can do it faster. You're supposed to like, take breaks. So I was like, oh, I can do it faster. And by the, like, the, immediately your tongue swells up the size of a frog and um, awful, you know. Lymph nodes swell up. You're sick. Your nose is running. Like, immediately, immediately, your body's just like, what is happening? This is bad, right? So it's, wor- it's worth it. It's worth it? It was a, um, I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to jump the gun. Uh, like, a, a hallucinations. I didn't sleep, you know. You can't. You know, you're just such horrendous pain. Can't eat broth a little bit, you know. Uh, so I didn't eat, sleep, or anything for seven days. And just every morning, another one, as tight as it would go. And every one you put on, you can feel it cut in past the flesh that's already, like, so swollen. It was so horrible. By the seventh day, I was, like, halfway through, and I was like, ah, I can't take it anymore. I didn't think I was, like, more like, I can't take it anymore, whatever it was. So I just took, a like, a razor blade and just cut the, way th- the rest of the way through it, and it just popped apart. And I see my, see my blood pumping out with my heartbeat. Oh. I just, like, <laughs> pulled all this, like, bloody fishing line out of my mouth. And <laughs> I couldn't stop the bleeding. I was just, like, I was getting so lightheaded. So I just stuffed my mouth full of gauze, and I went to sleep. Woke up the next day. So Good. here we are. Yeah, then for the next month, you got to take a – dental floss or fishing line and scrape the scabs off of either side mm. every single day and pull it apart or else it'll grow back together here i am now that was my tongue has now been split for longer than it hasn't like i my tongue has been that way for longer than it was normal at the age of 40 and so yeah i get the question a lot people are like was it worth it no you're <laughs> 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 like would you do it again I'm like Hell no. Yeah. That was I was eighteen, man. You remember being eighteen? You remember the dumb crap you did? Yeah. Hell no, dude. That was the dumbest thing. I almost killed myself. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's intense, bro. Like that's really it's a dumb intense. kid, man. But yeah, sweet so, story though. So. Yeah, that's yeah, it. makes for a good story. Ex- see, <laughs> exactly. It's all yeah. about the story. Absolutely. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> So that's why you call yourself because you performed I, I was, surgery I was like, on yourself. So instead of shade tree mechanic, yeah, I was like, oh, shade tree surgeon. Yeah, that's cool. I also tried yeah, to like cut a cyst out of my friend's back once. Oh, how'd that go? Not well. Is he still alive today? I thought it was yeah, but I thought it was like you know you can feel like a cyst in somebody. Ball. You're like oh, it was like a little ball. I was like yeah. oh, just like cut it open and pop it out. Mm-hmm. That is not how they're attached. <laughs> if you were wondering, 
<laughs> Actually, <laughs> it was. Yeah, it's not. There's like a lot of little fibers. Like that is not how it works. Yeah. Anyway, we had to go to the emergency room afterwards. Oh but shit! But I was like so convinced that I was like, it was like, can you cut it? I was like, I got this. I was like, I can cut this. Out. A practicing <laughs> surgeon. Yeah, I was like, I can do this. And I was like, <laughs> halfway into it, he's like bitching. I'm like, Brian, we're gonna. It's not working, dude. We're gonna have to go to the hospital. <laughs> Jeez, man. Downstairs, we were talking a little bit about you know Harley's, and you were talking about how Harley was the worst thing that ever happened to the Japanese bikes. And I thought it was kind of interesting, dude. the perspective that you offered. Oh, wh why would you say that, you know, Harley is the worst thing that happened to, to the Japanese bikes? But when Harley first started hitting home runs again, you know, in the, in the seventies and eighties, they well, mostly eighties, the AMF days, we don't talk about. Yeah. Too much. Yeah. But you know, they started hitting home runs again, man. The Evo was like a, that was what it was juggernaut, man. To this day. Yeah. You know, iconic. To this day. It's a, it's an amazing motor. I'm a, Evo, I love Evos, man. Say, so I'm a two stroke fanatic, Evo fanatic. I'm an Evo till I die. Love them. Yeah. Um, but what happened was, is when they started getting so popular, and of course, like the Reagan era um, tariffs on motorcycles over a certain size. So it made the, it forced the Japanese to compete on in a way that they had never done before. You had the 60s and 70s when bikes started, first started making more power. So you had these power wars that bore us the KZ1000 and the CB750. And the GT750, which I mentioned earlier, and the, the Kawasaki, the H, original H2, mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, anyway, and it's just like all these bikes that were just like big power. And then they limited, you can't make, you can't make that, you can't make those bikes anymore. You have to make smaller bikes. And also they have to be cruisers because that's what people are buying after the Evo came out. And so Japan started making some really interesting cruisers. You had bikes come out like the, the, the Eliminator, the Kawasaki Eliminator LTD, which is a really cool cruiser, four-cylinder cruiser. You had the Yamaha VMAX, uh, uh, the V4. You had the Honda V65 Magna. These were just like powerhouse bikes, and they're so cool. Non-traditional engines in such that they weren't just air-cooled V-twins, they, but they were still cruiser style. Like you look at a Yamaha VMAX, it's covered in aluminum, real aluminum, mm, yeah. and so not plastic. This is stuff that can be polished. Have you ever seen a done-up VMAX? They're just, like, polished to the max. They're just, like, very cruiser-style motorcycles, you know? Mm -hmm. Iconic. And so you had all these bikes that came out, and they just didn't really work. Like, nobody kind of bought them because everybody wanted to look like a Harley, uh, which is, again, back, you can't force people to buy them. And they want them to look like Harley, so Japan stopped making all those motorcycles, and they just made Harley clones. And so you had stuff like... Instead of the Honda V65 Magna, you got the Honda Magna. After they went, the, that went away, which was a 750, and it was plastic covered. It was chrome, plastic chrome yeah. covered with a uh, very Harley style, made almost no power. Um, then you got the Honda Shadow, which is still in production today. Yep. Um, you got things like the Honda VTX. Um, you got like the Suzuki Intruder went from this insane, super powerful four-cylinder motorcycle into like a very boring Harley clone. Like it's just a bare cold V twin again, you know? And that's so they just started making them look like Harleys and become kind of a second option to Harley Davidson. Like, oh, you don't want a Harley? You could have this. Instead. You want to save some money and more reliable? Yeah, it, exactly, yeah. exactly. But what happened is, is a lot of these bikes, Japan would just pump them out. And yeah. so they'd be around for like two years, three years, some of them longer, like a Honda Shadow, been around forever. Um, but there, a lot of them would only be out for a few model years, and they just stop making parts for them. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't uphold their old bikes like um, European and American brands do, because European brands do that as well. You can still build a BMW out of the BMW official parts catalog from like the seventies. Nice. You can build like a nineteen eighty five R one hundred from parts that are in stock at BMW. You know, so it's That's like they're, cool. they're, it's just companies yeah. that are like, okay, we need to, ju it's just different cultures, yeah. you know. Um, that's not anything bad. It just is what it is. Um, yeah, if I could just insert something really quick. This is interesting to hear you say this because you're, you're a builder. Like, there's a lot of people on YouTube that ride motorcycles, me being one of them. Um, I know a lot about Harleys. I know how to ride, but I don't claim to be a mechanic at all. And so to see guys like you that just kind of go for it in the garage – and just like, hey, we got a new project bike. Let's just source the parts and start building this thing. So I can tell you've amassed a lot of knowledge over the years of doing this, where you just get these project bikes and start building them. And, and you can say things like what you just did about BMW because you've 
probably had a Project BMW bike where you've tried to source parts on an old bike, right? Yeah, you know, it's, and that's from uh, Richard, my, one of my mentors, um, is a BMW fanatic, and so I know from him, from helping him build a couple of old R100s that you can literally go to a BMW dealership and order a part for a bike from 1986. You know, sometimes it has to come from Germany, but they still have the tooling for them. You know, they still have the tooling. They still make these parts. Uh, and Harley Davidson is the same way, you know, and even though Harley themselves doesn't make them there, Harley is very lucky in so much that they have the aftermarket that still makes these parts. Um, so the aftermarket are, are, they're keeping these tooling going and sometimes the parts are made overseas, but you know, like, what do you, what do you want here? Do you want the bike? You want the bike and you want the part for it or do you not? Like, right. You know, these are the way, this is the way of the world, man. I don't make the rules here. Uh, yep. but uh, the fact that they're available is insane. The fact that you can build a Harley Davidson that doesn't have a single part that came from Harley Davidson is insane. Yeah. That's totally insane. There's no other motorcycle in the world that you can do that with. Triumph, um, maybe, but not the motor. Are there car companies that you can do that? Like maybe um, the American car companies? Like Shelby? Maybe? There are aftermarket engine builders, but building the si- that engine is just, it's so massive compared to a motorcycle engine. Yeah. That's you true. know? And just also that they, like with Harley, it's still like, Again, because you can buy custom transmissions, you can buy custom engines, but mm-hmm. they're so massive, they cost a lot just physically to make. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you've got stuff like Baker Drivetrain and s and uh, you know, Total Performance, where I don't think Total Performance makes engines anymore. Uh, but, you know, all these companies, Axtel, you know, that are just like, they, the part is physically does not take a lot of metal right <laughs> compared yeah. to a car engine. raw materials yeah. are know? a lot less. Yeah. 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 And so you just go like, dude, yeah, build a motorcycle out of parts, man. Get a Baker transmission and a you know S and S engine and a and a Palco frame and you know um you know performance machine wheels and yeah. <laughs> you know so and you've done this before yeah and then just there <laughs> you can build a bike out of the uh, just have it show up at your door and it's a Tinker Toy set man yeah. and no other company does that besides Harley and I think that's so cool yeah. uh, on yeah. but except for BMW because you can order everything from BMW but it's only from BMW so you can still order like frames and stuff like that but it's from bmw so they don't have the aftermarket support that harley davidson does but yeah that's just uh, all these um japanese cruisers which i've enjoyed a lot of them a lot of them were very cool man the vtx was a pretty cool bike i thought when it came out i the yamaha warrior i thought was always a very cool bike <laughs> very different you know yeah um it just they built a lot of cool bikes man um but they just like it just killed them man because like nobody wins by making a clone you know? I, I agree with you. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like some of these Japanese manufacturers that you mentioned should have just played their own game as opposed to trying to copy Harley? Like, do you think that was a mistake? Or? So, you know who did that? It's the yeah. Euro manufacturers. So, a lot of people talk about now the modern classic to the point where it's getting played out, right? Oh, modern classic motorcycle. Well, that was Harley all day long. I mean, mm-hmm. that was the Dyna before mm-hmm. anybody. So, and you know this better than I, but the FXR was out, and the FXR was much derided at the time by Harley Puris as being Japanese, mm-hmm. um, mostly because of, you know, just rubber mounting, so there's you no know, vibrations, which, you know, old Japanese motorcycles also will vibrate your teeth out. You ever ride around an XS650? These people say, like, an iron head vibrates you? Yeah. <laughs> Try a Japanese bike. They're t- yeah. ten times worse. <laughs> it's just like, oh, they're so much worse, dude. I have built an XS650 chopper, dude. They're horrible. Huh. Like old Japanese bikes, they just didn't even try to make them not. You could sit there and rev the bike, and it would just turn in a circle on its kickstand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're so bad. They do a little dance. Yeah, dude. And then they started counterbalancing them in the 80s, yeah. and that's where, like, the big, because the soft tails back then, you know, were so rigid mounted. Yeah. Um, so, and then coming off the iron head, of course. But, uh, so the FXR was, of course, derided as being very Japanese, too smooth, um, yep. Very funny because of the exposed um, frame, which was very, which is just a classically built frame, which has a giant triangle for strength and rigidity on the side there, which they exposed on the FXR. But that was also something that was exposed a lot on Japanese motorcycles at the time, so it made it look Japanese. Mm. And and this is not the only reason. I don't know the minds of Harley Davidson, all the engineers, but you know this is one theory um, is that the Dyna came about because. The Dyna, it looked like an FXE. Like, I mean, they just go like, that looked like a fucking shovel head, man. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. was the first modern classic. The FXR was was forward, which, of course, I'm just like, it was just a FL frame. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like, yeah. it was not that special. 
everyone's like, oh, it was the coolest. People are like, it's the best thing that ever happened to Harley. And Eric Buell's a mastermind. I'm like, all he did was like take an FL frame and narrow it. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the greatest trick Eric Buell ever played on Harley Davidson. Right. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that's not a popular opinion. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny you say that because, yeah, I feel like, you know, I do a lot of, you know, my chat room warrior stuff, you know, and these people always want to tell you their opinion of everything and they want to educate you, which is great. I welcome it. But, yeah, it's it's funny how the FXR frame is so revered. It's in the world of yeah. Harley Davidson. It's like people have it up on this pedestal that it's just like the greatest thing that, that Harley has ever made. And I had a guy just in the showroom floor the other, the other day who was probably in his, like, mid-30s, and he's like, oh, hey, Matt. I don't know what to do. My buddies all have these belt out FXRs. I don't know if I should go with that or if I should just buy a new lowrider S. I said, listen, bud, do you want a, a, a better handling bike, uh, a more rigid bike in terms of you know, just the, the chassis rigidity, a, a more you know powerful bike and, and better, you know, pretty much every measurable metric in terms of performance is better, better brakes and everything. Or do you want a bike that is cool on bike night that has the the novelty of it yeah you know that that's your choice he's like yeah you know what now that i think about it my guys are, my buddies are always breaking down on their fxrs all the time and i'm like yeah they're cool bikes you have the novelty of it but do you want to get out there and ride then get the new bike and so i guess the point is is uh, it's amazing how ingrained the, the, the fxr and eric buell and his involvement with harley davidson is just this like prolific moment in harley davidson's history and harley davidson has just been downhill since that that time period and it was great and for its time the fxr was an amazing bike and it still is a great bike but um the fact of the matter is is technology has advanced since a the lot. fxr yeah, and, the, and the evo motor i yeah. mean the milwaukee <laughs> 8 if just from a reliability standpoint just like a refinement standpoint day-to-day -day just what user operation motor, what a yeah. great motor i love it the FXR yes. is funny, too, because the rubber mounting thing, which I can only assume that eventually Harley's going to do away with the rubber mounting in their touring line as well, because rubber mounted engines have gone from um, advanced to where, like, ooh, it doesn't doesn't vibrate you like a lawnmower anymore, like a shovel head did. And it's gone to antiquated, to where it's like, no, counterbalancing has gone come so far that mm -hmm. you don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, rubber mounted engines now are freaking dinosaurs. Well, and when the Milwaukee A first came out, you know, Harley Davidson purposefully engineered a degree of uh, rumble in the motor, you know, a degree of, of vibration in the motor just to give you that sensation of Even this is a the, Harley. Even the rigid mounted ones? Not, not the soft tails. Okay. Yeah, the soft tails are 100% counterbalanced, but in the touring chassis bikes, yeah, yeah. they engineered Crazy, purposefully. Right? Yeah, the, I think... Technically, they said that it's it's seventy five percent vibration has been canceled out with the the primary balancers, but right. in the soft tails because they're hard mounted, it's a hundred percent of the primary shaking forces have been canceled out. But um, it's weird. I have to come. It's come full circle. So we're like this is old now. Yeah, and but, the FXR is definitely that man. It's an old design, and um, I speak all this crap about FXR. And Eric Buell, still, just so nobody jumps on our throats, Eric Buell is an amazing engineer who, right. whose talent I could never hope to even come close Agreed. to. Agreed. Yeah, no, he's I, an amazing engineer. But the FXR was definitely like he definitely was like hoodwinking Harley on that one. <laughs> it just like changed the rake and like narrowed a FL. Like, let's all agree on that. <laughs> I haven't heard that. <laughs> I haven't heard that perspective, but I do not disagree. Uh, so. I just, I mean, and I and I own an FXR. Yeah. Like I love them. But what what like, don't you own? You know, actually, like, like a it, lot of bikes that I still want. Trust me, <laughs> there's a lot on my list. Uh, I mean, how just approximately how many bikes do you have in your collection right I now? Oh man, like do you have just like a lot of bikes that are just project bikes? Like, like a lot like, of project bikes, but bikes are so cheap, man. I'm glad I never got bitten by the car bug because cars are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to have a lot of cars when I was in high school. Cars are still cheap. You know, I had a 69 Mustang that I restored, and I had a 67 Fury 3 that I restored, a 79 Bron had two different 79 Broncos, an 89 Bronco, like all sorts of different cars and trucks. Just buy them and sell them like trading cards, man. Yeah. I, I, I just go to the side of the road. I go, like, first, bron first Bronco I ever owned was a 79 Bronco. Excuse me. And I bought it off the side of the road for 600 bucks. Mm, you nice. know? and But you can't do that anymore. No. You know, that's not the way it is. It's still like that with motorcycles. Yeah. You can still buy cheap motorcycles. Yeah. So I just really like possessing them. Yeah. I like to have it. I like to look at it. You know, I like to walk out in my garage. I'll just walk around. Even a bike that's almost down to the frame, I'll just walk around it and look at, I'll look at all the welds and 
where the motor's mounted and how the motor looks, and I just like to observe, like just stare at it, you know. And I like to, I love, obviously, I love to ride them too, but I'll just ride the, anything. It Absolutely. doesn't have to be fancy for me to ride. I'll ride yeah. anything, yeah. but I like yeah. looking at them, like just the design choices, because motorcycles are weird, man. They're not like cars. Yeah, they're weird in such a way that the design choices are not necessarily to make them better. You know, yeah. motorcycles are different. They don't make them better. They don't make design choice. They make design choices to make them appeal to us more while trying to hide how it's better. So it's a really weird design that goes into making a motorcycle. I like that quote a lot, actually. Yeah, that, that's really cool because I agree with you, you know. Um, and we talk about this a lot with Harley Davidson. Um, everybody criticizes Harley Davidson for not producing the most peaky horsepower or having the most modern technology on them, although their technology, I think, is in a lot of cases a lot better than people might think. But it's they build a cool bike that delivers a certain feel and sound, and they're not always engineered to be the most advanced. They're engineered to be an interesting, cool piece yeah. of machinery. It's not supposed to be the best. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah. help that Harley-Davidson is the most critiqued motorcycle company ever. It's because there's more yeah. of them. Yeah, than anyone else, and we've been here longest. So, that, and that will always be whoever's made the most will always be the most critiqued, yeah. which technically should be Honda. But if you yeah. don't count um, small CC bikes, then it's Harley by a long yeah. shot. There are more Harley Davidson Sportsters on the road than any other two motorcycles combined. It's insane mm -hmm. how many Sportsters are on the road yeah. on the road today, right now. Um, there, there are so many Sportsters out there uh, in America. Of course, you know you go to. You know, you go to Thailand, and there's like about a billion freaking <laughs> Cub 125s on the road. But I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. in America, there are more Harley Davidson sportsters on the road than any other two motorcycles combined. Uh, yeah, and you know how I learned that? I didn't. I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your, your intuition, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I just like thought. Of. Anyway, but I, I would I'd go to bat for that. I think that that's true. And so since Harley Davidson are so prevalent, it's so easy to make fun of them because there's more of them. So it makes someone who made a different choice go like, well, I made the smarter choice because that's what everybody does is that. But I did this. And I'm not saying any of those choices are bad. A lot of them are great. They're great bikes. I, like, I don't, I'm not loyal to Harley Davidson in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, uh, let, let's talk about your Honda, man. Every time you get on your Honda Goldwing, like I just can't help but laugh. There's just something about Shade Tree Surgeon and his Hawaiian shirt going down dude. the road with his Goldwing and these like figurines. Like, what is it, a hula girl yeah. you got yeah, on there yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. Dude, like, Garfield, I, the sticky Garfield. Yeah, the Garfield yeah. Dude, I'm just freaking <laughs> laughing, dude. Like, this so guy's a character. I love my Goldwing because um, Goldwings are an excellent example of uh, one of the first nice cars I owned was a 1993. Lincoln Mark 8. Nice. Um, so it was the first car, it was the first Ford car to ever come with the all aluminum block double overhead camshaft 4.6, which would eventually become the Cobra motor once they moved to the 4.6 platform from the 5.0 and the Mustang. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with cars at Absolutely. all. I was a Ford mechanic for years. N no, um, not, not near so, the level you are, no. So the, a hot engine. You're talking about an engine that made 300 plus horsepower in 1993. That was a big deal in 93. Um, it set the world land speed record, which still holds for a stock car. Does mm. it really? Wow. Yes. Yeah, it went like, a hun like 194 miles an hour, completely stock. And now this nice. is not counting the class. This is like whatever class it was in, but it still holds, dude. It's a nut it was a nutso okay. body design engine, and they made the first edition really hot. It had a very hot transmission, shifted really hard, automatic transmission, but would still break loose in second gear. Great car. That's nobody, why they were police cars. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> bought it, right? Mm. And the, originally in 1993, this was a $47,000 car. $47,000? $47,000 in 93. It's got to be almost a $100,000 car now. So in 1998, when I was in high school, I bought one for $3,000. Nice. And I had a 300-plus horsepower car in high school that I just ripped everywhere because nobody was buying it. It was like grandma's car, but with mm. a hot engine. That's what gold wings are. Gold wings <laughs> are some of the most expensive motorcycles you can buy. Brand new. Mm. And yeah. just once you buy them, their value just drops like a stone. And I don't even know why, but it does. Their resale market on Gold Wings is zero. So when I first found that out, I was looking at it, I was like, damn, dude, I can buy a 89, 1500 Gold Wing, which was one of the most technologically advanced motorcycles to ever exist for $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> I was Sign like, yeah, I'm going to buy one, dude. I want one. <laughs> like, this is like, I could have never afforded this. This is one of these, one of the most expensive motorcycles you'd buy in 1989. I yeah. could buy one for a thousand bucks. 
Absolutely. It's got so many buttons. The retro futurism is so cool. Like so many buttons all over. The thousand buttons, dude. Now everyone wants like a touch screen. Back in the eighties, you want buttons, man. That's yeah. what yeah. that's the future. It's actually true. Yeah, you feel like you're in the cockpit of like a helicopter yeah, or something like yeah. that when you get one of those. But yeah, now like there's discussions about yeah, these these switch housings are too cumbersome. There's too many controls. How can we eliminate that? And it's all about how you can get to what you want through just one menu on the screen. I don't yeah. want to have to go through four menus. So yeah, the 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 dialogue and just the the narrative behind that has completely changed. Yeah, and it is what it is. But it's a design choice that I always liked. I always liked a lot of buttons. <laughs> you know, so I was just like, "Oh, it's got buttons. I like that." You like to feel like you're in the command center, exactly. Or something like that. And I don't push any of them because I'm afraid I'm going to turn one on. It's going to like blow every fuse in the bike. But <laughs> I like that they exist. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just thought that it was so cool because their reliability factor is so through the roof, and there's such a strong aftermarket support for them, like Harley's. Goldwings are one of the closest um, bikes to Harley Davidson that I could ever imagine. They were built in America up until very recently. Um, all the parts are made in America. They are one of the very, one of the few bikes that had an entire section of the drag specialties catalog. Oh, really? I didn't day. even know that. Yeah, what does drag make? Drag makes Harley parts. Yeah. And Goldwing parts. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so Goldwings were uh, definitely a big Harley alternative, but in a way that was all their own, which I thought was very unique and something that I really enjoy. Like I was telling you earlier about the old Japanese cruisers. I like something that was like, this is an alternative to a Harley Davidson, a cruiser or a grand tour like the Goldwing is, mm -hmm. but it's all its own bike. It's all Honda. It's yeah, all that's... its own bike. And I agree with you a hundred percent, Josh. And that's one of the things I appreciate about Honda. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my, I grew up riding Honda dirt bikes. I know, yeah. you know, Andrew grew up in the desert on the dirt bikes as well. Um, and so I, I've always liked Honda, not for cruisers, of course. Yeah, I never, I never owned a Goldwing, but I can appreciate it for what it is. Absolutely. <laughs> Seventies um, Honda CBs, the seven fifties, the six fifties, yeah, five hundred. They twins. make a good product. Yeah. I want to yeah. show on my on my barrel list is a V sixty five. I really would like one. I'm just their. They don't have near the support that the V Max does, so it's hard to find. If you don't find one in really good condition, it's hard to put them back that way. Yeah. But whereas the V Max has a great support network. So let's talk about your your barrel list as you call it. These are a, a, a bunch of bikes that you want to have sometime in your life. The you bikes that were on my wall as a kid. Okay. You know, like right. V-Max and the V65 and a lot of Harleys too, the FXR. Um, I always wanted an FXE. I have one now. You know? Cool. cool. Um, I always wanted an FXE shovel head. So bad, dude. And I like what people are doing with them now. I don't know if they're doing it if it's a West Coast thing or not, but I've seen like the new, you know, chopper and custom culture goes through so many different things now. And the really, like, up-and-coming style I've seen, I always call them attack choppers, but I'm sure there's a different name for them. It's like a deraked yeah. chopper. But right now, like, the custom guys where everyone was making them skinny, and I made a skinny chopper. I made a skinny long neck, like, long fork chopper. I mm -hmm. love it. Easy rider uh, chopper, I yes, used to call them. Yeah. <laughs> and, but now, and I still think it's cool because I'm just, I'm a, I wash with the tides, too, you know. I'm a victim of, of the zeit, the public zeitgeist, you know. Yeah, but, trends. Uh, uh just, I really like the D-Rake choppers, and a lot of guys are doing really cool ones on old FXEs, where it's a swing arm chopper with, like, a... They'll usually put, like, a crazy Frank fender on them, which is, like, the dual taillight yeah. sissy bar fender for a swinger. And um, then they'll do a D-Rake, so it'll be a tall neck, D-Rake front end. So long fork, tall neck. So the wheel is still in the same place where it would be stock, but with a tall neck. Mm, yeah. And then they just will put, like... Very nice suspension on them. Uh, Brembo brakes, or I, I, Brembo brakes are so stupid. Why would you, do, when Performance Machine exists, why would you put Brembo brakes on a bike? <laughs> I think Performance Machine makes such a beautiful brake caliper. Yeah. And they perform, I think, I've been on plenty of both of the motorcycles, and Performance Machine performs absolutely just as good as a Brembo does. Hmm, interesting. It, um, and, and, they, and they look awesome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They have I a beautiful PM product, brakes, dude. Yeah. Anyway, so um, they'll do them like that with like good brakes, uh, you know, uh, you know. But then it'll be like a foot clutch, mm -hmm. you know, with all this stuff. So it's just like this mashup of the whole uh, performance motorcycle club style with choppers. But what's really interesting, what I didn't think about, what somebody else pointed out to me, is that they look like choppers in the nineties. Hmm. A little bit because they're okay. just because the choppers in the nineties were that really tall neck, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. you know, yeah, and no, like, and I'm, j but it's not though. But you can go like, 
it's got influence from that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's neat to see the way that things evolve like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I really want to build a derig shovel. <laughs> that's <laughs> basically what that's coming down to. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. And I know the type of bike you're talking about. And I, dude, those are cool. I like those a lot. Do you ever go to Born Free? You ever been to that show? No, I never have. I would like to go. You really need to go to that show. I'm sure there was like, a lot of that bike there. 100%. <laughs> that's why I bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, of everything, but there's plenty of those there. And these are guys that are like the best chopper builders in the world. Yeah. Show up to that, you know, outside of maybe like Moon Eyes in Japan and those guys who do a phenomenal job as well. But um, yeah, you should make it a point. Now there's a Texas show too, which is a little bit yeah. closer to you. I suck at making it to shows. I, I, I kind of suck at making it shows as well. I just but like, because I do things when I want to. And that's not like I'm like, I'm too cool to go to a show. But it's hard for me to go, like, oh, I'm going to be here at this time. Because I'm just like, nobody f- tells me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> it is across the country, you know, like, too. Yeah. It's not convenient. Yeah. It's yeah. an airplane flight, you know. Like, yeah. I could yeah. be there. But then I don't have a bike when I show up, you know, which is lame. Yeah, so. yeah well. I'm just like, if I, because also I'm just like, you ever find this? You ever go on vacation where motorcycles aren't involved? I'm sure you have. Your family yeah. man, right? Yep. Um, so you have to. I don't, I don't have a family. So I don't have to do anything. <laughs> you so, only do what you want. Yeah. I, yes, and much to my detriment sometimes. Uh, so it's like I can't imagine going anywhere unless motorcycles are involved. And I and I and it, sometimes it's upsetting. Sometimes I go like, "Am I a one trick pony? Is this some? Is just motorcycle?" But I'm like, I don't really care. You're <laughs> a man. You're a man who knows what yeah. he likes. I just I know what I like because really, someone's like, "Oh, I would love to visit this town." I'm like, "Me too." I have a motorcycle when I get there (laughs) because I have to, even if I don't barely ride it, but I have to have it. I have to. So that the whole, like uh, where you rent a motor, what they call it, like twisted road, all those things. Best thing to ever happen to me, dude. Cause now I'm like, Oh, I'll go there. Sure. I'll rent a motorcycle, dude. Yep. You know, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. I love it. That's funny. Cause I'm the same way though. It's like, when I think about vacation, it's like, like when you rented the Harley out in in, uh, Hawaii, like yeah. I want to do that. I want to go to Europe and ride around Europe. Yeah, you know, get a GS and just go, if you I know, w- France and Germany and all that. If I know? went yeah. somewhere for a week, and I only rode a motorcycle one day, but I had the motorcycle all seven days, that would be okay. Yeah, but I have to have it. Yeah, it has to be an option. Yeah, or else yeah. I'm not f- going. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the way I look at it too is, I think the skill and the ability to ride a motorcycle is a skill that isn't shared by a whole lot of people. I mean, what's yeah. the percentage of people that ride motorcycles yeah. like confidently on the highway or in a foreign country or something like that? Like it's very low, you know, I'd say probably less than 5% of the population. Yeah. And so being able to go somewhere cool and then to amplify the coolness with being on two oh, wheels, yeah. like yeah. why not Just, if, yeah. if you have that ability? I think it's uh, what I always called as manufactured adversity. I have a theory on motorcycles. <laughs> I like what this I've is going already. Everything, by the way, <laughs> Let's go. I hate it when motherfuckers don't have opinions, dude. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, I don't have an opinion on that." I'm like, "Really? You boring? Yeah, they're not boring. interesting people. Yeah. You ain't got an opinion? Yeah, on that? I got an opinion on everything because <laughs> <laughs> you're very cultured. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, cultured. <laughs> don't cuss at me like that. <laughs> so, motor- motorcycles are manufactured adversity. Any long trip that you take on a motorcycle, you could have taken in a car. You could have taken it in a plane. You could have viewed a video on the subject that you went there to look at at all. There's always certainly different ways that would make it easier for you to do less dangerous, um, just less time-consuming. There's all these things that you could do that don't involve riding this bizarre object, this engine with two wheels on it that, that, uh, that just, like, transports you. On the roads, the roads are not meant for play. The roads are meant to transport people somewhere, but we've turned them into play with this. It's, it's just this manufactured adversity mm-hmm. because there's something inside us that craves adversity, and we live in a society that does not give us adversity. So yeah. we have to manufacture it. Yeah, Everything that we around us, we can make it easier. We can make it faster. We can make it safer. So what I think with subconsciously what we do and what we crave is a way to make it more dangerous because our bodies like that. Mm-hmm. And that goes all the way back to like, gosh, like the Fertile Crescent, and 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 when we first started planting fields, instead of going to hunter and gatherer, like if you're in a hunter gatherer society, well, you don't need to manufacture it first. You ain't got time you're, to even think about it, dude. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah. I wake up, I hunt, like, and if I don't catch anything, we're gonna die. Right. So there's yeah. adversity. You don't have to make any. Right. And then even then, when you know we got into the Fertile Crescent and and we figured out how to plant crops and we had that amazing 
wonderful and also horrible thing that uh, that sprang up from going from a hunter gatherer society to a sedentary society, which is called free time. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. So, what do you do with free time? Well, when you have nothing but free time and everything's easy, we're still cavemen. You manufacture adversity. Yeah. So, going somewhere on a motorcycle creates an adventure where it could just be an experience, and you don't have to do that to experience it. But we choose to do that because there's something inside us, some throwback, some sort of weird lizard hindbrain back there that craves that. And this scratches that itch. And, of course, some of us have it more than others. <laughs> All the people seated here who need yeah. to scratch. It is just like a raw, gaping, open wound that must constantly be f***ed with. <laughs> <laughs> instead of, scab, instead of just slightly yeah. scratched, we're just... Picking at the scab yeah. of the open mind. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, agree more, man. Well said, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I usually describe it. I agree with you. I think I describe it in a little bit different way. Your way is a little bit more interesting, though. But I, I just think that, you know, in this day and age where there's, like, you know, men's mental, mental illness and depression and things like that, it's like, dude, you need more adventure in your life. Mm. And, I mean, you, you call it adversity, which I agree with. But, you know, guys need to have adventure. If you don't have adventure in your life, then – you, you're, you're going to be depressed. You're going to have things, you know, you're not going to be happy. Like you have to overcome adversity, have an adventure to be fulfilled in life. Absolutely. I feel like. And that's just, that's in your, that's not a, even a mental thing. That's a physical thing at some point. If you're not enjoying the grind and the everyday, yeah. you know, struggle, you're, you're missing life really is what you're doing. What do you do when you get there? You tell the story. You tell the story, yeah. <laughs> and you, you plan you plan your next trip, like we talked about. And you in the go beginning. like, what story are we going to tell What's next? next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. funny because when we just got home from our trip uh, with the two lane life guys, I don't know if you watch those guys or not, but um, or, or, or like the next day, it's kind of like, what's our next trip? Yeah. You know? yeah. After we just kind of went through like a hellish trip, really, you know, just got back. Yeah, just got <laughs> back from like pouring rain for like two days and you know cold temperatures, and it's like that was cool. Let's what's what's the next one? You know? Yeah. yeah. And it's so simple. And I think that a lot of people um, languish under that it needs to have some sort of higher meaning. And it doesn't. Yeah. It's just fun. Right. And right. Our life is temporary. So you might as well have as much fun as you possibly can. Amen, brother. So I, I just like it just doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so many people overcomplicate things, and so I agree with you. I wanted to touch real quick. Um, what can we expect from Shade Tree Surgeons Channel in the future? You know, what what are your goals for this next year, and uh, what what can people expect out of the Shade I'm, Tree? I don't know what I'm doing next week. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to have a whole video out tomorrow. You, you you put you put you put timelines on yourself like that? Absolutely. You, you put out a lot of content. Like I'm two videos that. a week. I put out two videos a week for almost ten years, and I've never missed a day. Damn, that's I have missed impressive. A day. I have missed a day. Okay, <laughs> for, the, for the most part, though, yeah, like. for the most part, that's ridiculous to say I've never missed a day. Of course, I've missed a day, um, but almost never. Like I think I I could ha- count on less than I could count on two hands the amount of days I've missed in in a decade of two videos a week because I just. I don't know, man. I do my best work with my back against the wall, you know? Yeah. I need to manufacture a little adversity, sometimes to my detriment. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you know, looking at a guy like you on the surface, you seem like a very carefree, you know, and one of the things I said to you downstairs was like, I love your channel because it's super genuine. I know that you're not trying to be someone or like come off as a, a different person than you are in real life. And you're just a dude that genuinely loves motorcycles, which is another trait that I really admire about you. You know motorcycles very, very well, and I think a lot of people fake it that they know bikes better than they really do or can ride better than they really do, and they come off as an expert on YouTube. You don't try to come off an, uh, as an expert on YouTube oh, when God. really you have the credibility as com- as probably having the credentials to be an expert, but you don't no, try to no, you no, don't no, you no. don't try to leverage Somebody that. Somebody else has always got a bigger dick, man. So I, it, it, I, and I agree, but what I'm saying is it's refreshing to have someone to watch on YouTube that isn't trying to be something more important or bigger than they really what, are. You so know? everything, and thank you. That's an incredible compliment. I, re- I appreciate it very much. Um, I don't want to just like gloss over that while I just disagree because that's what a <laughs> shitty thing to do. <laughs> someone gives you a compliment you're like no yeah. this is, and you're like no thank you man that's an incredible compliment i appreciate it you're welcome it. I appreciate you it very it. much and it made me feel good thank good. you yeah um but every i mean just like anybody else everything i learned i learned from somebody else 
You know, nothing, no knowledge I have now besides some philosophies, which arguably are tainted by all the things that have come on to come to me, you know, like some of my philosophies are mine and my own, everything else I've just learned by watching other people and, and, and consuming content and listening and paying attention. None of it is of my own invention. So when I say something like talk about like engineering and the FXR and all this stuff, like I'm not, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I'm just like talking about a time and place, man. I'm like, you know, this is the difference between an actual scientist and watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. I'm not, I wouldn't even, you said I'm a builder. I'm not even a builder, man. I barely know how to weld. I'm not afraid to weld. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not say I'm a welder. I know how. Not yeah. a welder. So not, a, not in the slightest, dude. Well, sometimes like, heat it up and pile it on, dude. Like, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just having the mentality to go for it, I think, is, is a lot. Because, I mean, there's certain things that it's like, dude, I don't even, even want to try that. Because I don't know if it's the uh, being afraid of failure or just not wanting to... Accept failure it, as an option. Accept failure or, you know, just expend the, the time and effort that it would require. But, you know, everybody gets their knowledge from somewhere, right? Even the smartest guys in the world. They read books. Yeah. They learn. We're all so, standing on the backs of giants, man. Right. So, uh, so when we talk about engineers, which I love my joke because I was a mechanic for years, and I always would say, only an engineer would crawl over 50 naked women to f*** a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But engineers exist on such a plane that is that is beyond me. Like the, the engineering, the design, and the degrees, and the math that's involved with that. Oh, it's insane. And so when, when I say, like, I'm a motor, when I build motorcycles, I don't really, but I say I'm a motorcycle builder. I'm playing with the toys. I'm playing with the parts that people better than me have made. Right. Yep. And it's anybody who's a motorcycle builder. Now, there are guys who surpass that, obviously, who engineer crazy things, but... If I just grab the parts that somebody else has engineered, if I take a 39 millimeter show a front end that was engineered by somebody else, and uh, you know all these things, I'm like, I'm not. What am I doing? I'm playing Tinker Toys, man. Right. Like this is not. This is not anything special. Yeah. I'm not gonna. I don't hate it. I still have a lot of fun doing it. But to to say that it's something special is just the height the height of arrogance. You know, yeah. we are all standing on the backs of somebody else. Even engineers are standing on the backs of other of other engineers, you know. Weird yeah. thing to think about engineers is that you had guys who, in the 80s, you know, this is a, a big car thing. Um, you say you're into, car, you're into cars, especially car engineering. Like, I'm a huge fan of the history of car engineering. Ford turbos and an American turbocharged engine in the 80s. Um, you have these blocks that were built that can withstand something like a thousand horsepower, but they were built and they made like 180 because you had engineers designing these things to say like they're the bosses said you have to make small displacement engines that make better gas mileage and more power SVO. And they're just like, well, you have the same guys building these engines that were designing cars in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're just like, I don't know what a turbo does, man. Yeah. I don't know, build the bottom end. And so you have these engines that were just like made no horsepower, but then people get a hold of later, like, you know, the thing can make like a thousand horsepower on a stock bottom end. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's, a, it, it's weird. So they're standing on the shoulders of people before them. Yeah. And so when you come to engine engineers, before that, before guys who were designing cars that we remember, like the Thunderbird Turbo Coupe, a car that was a very desirable car. It's on my barrel list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thunderbird Turbo Coupe which was the SVO Mustang engine, yeah. the 2.3 uh, liter um, turbocharged engine. They still actually use that same design. They pulled it out to build a new EcoBoost four-cylinder. Four yeah. It's the same exact design because it was engineered so well. Oh, okay. So who is that engineer standing on? Yeah. She was a, he was a young man, a young buck, engineering things in the 50s and 60s. Who is he standing on? He's standing on the mother who invented the engine. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, like, yeah. like yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's it's insane. Yeah, how short a time span we're on, and and then that's everything from nuclear power plants to everything. Like the people that they're standing on, what they had to do build for them to stand on top of. And if you say I'm a builder, or I do this, or I modify, we're just like doing such small things. That doesn't mean it's not fun, right? But we're not engineers. No, not even close. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's funny too, like the dynamic and and a lot of times the argument that gets started with, you know, oh, this is the the road king that I built. You know, and, built, and not bought. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then people <laughs> then people like, Oh, did you really build it? Yeah. You know, yeah, you yeah, bolted yeah. you bolt it on you a seat a front in your garage. End. Right. Yeah. But that's that right. that's that thing where people want to put labels on stuff yeah. and we're like, Oh, right. is this is this? And it's like, no, man, we're just having fun. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's like calm down. We know that we didn't like weld and like cast all the, the yeah. frame and everything yeah. from scratch. But at the same time, can we just say the word build and just have fun over here? Like yeah. without yeah. all the judgment from the guy that you know, cast all of his own pieces of his motor. You know, Most of those like, guys aren't actually talking shit, though. They're busy, like, sand casting parts. Yeah. It's someone <laughs> else true. who knows that ex- that uh, that exists. 100%. 100% because I hear right. those people, and I see those people, like, we didn't build it, you didn't do this. I'm just like, I know, dude, like, Jared Weems, who's a, a, a contributor of mine, a, won a, a best import of show at Born Free mm-hmm. for his Triumph build. Hmm. Okay. That guy can sand cast parts. That guy is an engineer. Mm-hmm. That guy can make anything. Mm-hmm. I think he gives a f- if somebody says built, not bought, no, after no. they like put some bolts on. No, he's like, good for you, dude. I'm glad you're f- having fun. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. someone else who knows about it, who, who, goes, who uses their knowledge that that exists to hold that over somebody else who doesn't know it exists. I agree 100%. And just like, I figured this out. It was like, you didn't figure that out. You just know about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's different. Like, yeah. that's like someone being like, I could have thrown a better touchdown pass. I'm like, why? Because you heard John Madden tell you, like, yeah. how they could have done it better? Like, yeah. you're as you're sitting in your armchair? Like, no. Yeah. Dude, have you ever met a football player? They're as tall as you, and they weigh as much as me. <laughs> yeah, like, they are not human, dude. <laughs> yeah. You are not playing professional football. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, you can't do that shit. Well, I mean, we can start a whole another conversation on the keyboard warriors. I'm sure you've dealt with your your battles with the keyboard warriors. And I'll say this about comments, man. I say this about the comment section all the time. I read every single comment that's ever been left on every single video I've ever made, no matter what. If I've made the, if I've taken the time to make a video, and someone takes the time to comment in a video, they deserve me to read it. Do I respond to it? Can't. Not to that many. Don't even heart them. Because now you can hard to let somebody know you read it. Mm-hmm. But I feel bad doing that if they ask a question. Because I'm just like, oh, I read it and I didn't answer your question. but I just So I just don't even do anything. I just read them. <laughs> right? Uh, if someone leaves a comment that makes you feel bad. Right? And you're just like, God. And you're just like, it gets you. And you're sitting on your by yourself in your YouTube studio and your phone. And you're just like, you motherfucker. You motherfucker. You I fucking. I swear to God. For God, God I hate this guy. <laughs> Guess what? It was right. They got you. Yeah. Because yeah. guess what? If they said something you were already thinking, it's because you were already thinking it. Because you were already self-conscious about it. You already didn't like that part of your video. The and truth, they the just said hurts. it. Yeah. And yeah. they just said it. You're like, God damn. God. <laughs> so that's what you're I try to right. do. Every time I read a comment, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, damn, they got me though. <laughs> they, <laughs> you know? They yeah. seem to. They got, yeah. they got, they got me, you. dude. And so yeah. that's what I try to do when I read like a e- e- war- e- keyboard warrior thing. I just go like, you write that. Yeah. And I still don't respond. And if I do, I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know But in my head, I'm just like, mm, you were right, though. Yeah. You know what you should do? You should try, because I've done this before. You should be like, you know what? You're right. I do need to do that differently. Then all of a sudden, the next comment will be like, oh, you know, but I love your stuff. You know, you're doing a good Always, job. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, they flip their tone 100%. Yeah. It's interesting how people, just the fact that they, they said some some crap back to you, and you, re- you took the time to respond to them, and, like, you weren't defensive about it. It brings down people's like level of like. I can't tell you how many people would just be like, you know, I was just having a really bad day, and yeah. the fact that you take that time to look at somebody instead of just writing them off and throwing them to the wolves because it's so easy to do, you know, with the people who who follow us and like thank you to all them who are very very um, aggressively loyal fans that you can just take somebody who leaves mean content comment and like point at and go like, here you go and just like throw this person to the wolves to be torn apart or you could take a moment out of your day to be kind to them recognize them as a human being and hear what they have to say and i have over the years i've been making youtube videos hundreds of those people who are the most loyal fans that i've ever had Mm. and i wouldn't even i hate even using the word fan i would say friend yeah um because i always just say like i don't have fans i just have friends i haven't met yet yeah because, like, every time I meet someone from YouTube, it's just, I'm just like, they're like, oh, I'm a big fan. Like, we start talking, I'm like, they're like, they're like, it's like I know you. I'm like, well, fuck, it's like I know you. Like, we like the same shit. Like, we're yeah. friends. Yeah. You know? 
Well, cool. Well, I appreciate this uh, sit down. Oh, I'm not done. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can I'll go. I'll tell you what. We're, we're going to kick him out of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I could no. go for another few. I've still got a bit of beer left. Man. You guys want to be? I, I don't, but um, I, I, if people are, have listened this far, I mean, I guess why not just go an hour longer? I got right? one no. more beer, dude. So <laughs> I got one more beer, Matt. If you're here for one more beer, I'm here with you for one more beer. You can say well, no. You know, well, the thing is, Josh, is we, we actually have to go down and sell some bikes, too, man. I mean, like. You ain't got a salesman for them? Uh, we have a couple, yeah, um, but two of them are well, sitting right hiring? in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, we would love to sell you a bike. You know, we, we need, yeah, like. Yeah, I need I want a road king, dude. I'm I'm fucking fixed on the M8 now, dude. Okay. I was trying to figure it out because, God, I love the way a twin cam sounds. That's like the, oh, there goes your floor, dude. <laughs> That's okay. That's what mops are for. Don't worry about yeah. it. What? Uh, That's carpet. <laughs> um, well. Dude, I was, like, almost, like, trying to make up my mind on a road king because, I just think a Road King was like, that's the FXR better, right? That's like the modern FXR. Heavier, sure, yeah, whatever, you know, but like, I was like, oh, I want a Road King so bad. It's a great bike, man. And I could not make up my mind between like a, an Evo between Cam or a Milwaukee 8. Speaking of Road Kings, uh, you know, I, I had kind of a little bit of a paradigm shift with you. For a long time, like I said, I, I, I've... Um, I've respected the type of content you do um, for your uniqueness and your obvious knowledge and history with, with motorcycles. It wasn't until your Road King video that I think you did a review with Burt's uh, Harley yeah, Davidson yeah. where I was like, okay, this guy knows bikes. Like, this is a really good objective review on the Road King that is going to help someone Thank watching you, man. this. Because I, obviously, I do a lot of reviews. God, dude, you and, get such uh, compliments. Man. I try, you know. I I figure if I just try, I'm, I'm gonna harass you the whole time and say negative <laughs> things, and you probably won't come back. No, I'm and just like, <laughs> damn. All right, dude. Yeah. I go. I could come once a week, man. This is nice. <laughs> Sign up. <for> this. <laughs> I'm leaving out all the bad things I think about you. I'm just saying the good things. But um, it's cool, man. I can, I can write a book about the bad things people think about me. <laughs> we we critique bikes. Obviously, Harley Davidsons is what the majority of our content is around because we work at a Harley dealership. But um, I feel like there's so many guys that do reviews on Harleys versus like, dude. You, you missed it, man. Like, this is not a good review of the bike at all. You don't know anything about motorcycles, and this is not a helpful review for a consumer that wants to buy this bike. However, when I watched yours, I was like, dude, this guy is a knowledgeable dude that is being fair, very fair about this bike in both the, the, the pros and the cons of, of this bike. So, I mean, if you want to buy a Hyundai Sonata, like, or, and, that, and that's not a dig against Korean car manufacturers because actually I think right now Korean car manufacturers are making some of the most beautiful cars on the planet. Uh, they're like where Europe, European car manufacturers were in the 90s. But if you want to buy a Econo box, you want a review that takes it apart, dissects it. That, that ain't a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Motorcycles are about how it makes you feel, what it makes you feel. Like the, the the visceral feeling of like how you touch it, how it sounds, how it, and everything. Just especially Harley's with a, it's the starter for me. The starter is so good on a Milwaukee Eight. It's like they got it perfect, and I would just be damned if that wasn't in, on purpose. You know, and they're never going to yeah. say it because Harley keeps those. They keep them close, but I would be damned if that starter wasn't on purpose. It's just that like low, like you're like, oh, it's not even going to start. It's like a chugga, chugga, <laughs> chugga. It's like an air, like when they start airplanes. Right. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, oh, it just makes you feel. Some. And the and the buttons are like they're so chunky. Yeah. And they click. And they feel mm -hmm. so good. The buttons are so good on her. And the 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 ignition button is just this solid like thunk. Big and simple. You know? Yeah, mechanical and feeling. And it makes you yeah. feel like so good. Like this is just you're starting this just like this monstrous beast. Like you're just like <laughs> right. pulling levers and right. hitting buttons and like this like sort of crazed steam engine, yep. like weird Jules Verne esque invention <laughs> that you're getting to yep. move down the road. It feels so good. Yeah. And that is on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. like that's not an accident. Yeah. I think what you just said right there needs to be canned up and just sent to the engineers at Harley Davidson because what you just did said you you just captured the essence of what so many people love about harley davidson um and and it's i love it when i get people on the tangent that you were just on just the different people that we invite here because everybody says it in just a little bit different way but at the end of the day it's kind of the same message that just that same raw excitement. mechanical yeah. feel of a yeah. harley davidson 
that is just that big, simplistic, heavy duty parts, the big switches, like you, you know, uh, just just yeah, mentioned. Feels so, good, man. Yeah, yeah. So, but so something I didn't get to mention earlier, and I hate to just like take this in a completely different way, is we talked about how Harley Davidson was the worst thing to ever happen to Japanese motorcycles, Japanese cruisers, really. Yeah. Jap- Japan obviously makes amazing sport road, bikes, sport bikes, and yeah. dirt bikes, and I got or I, I'm a Austrian man myself, but <laughs> uh-huh. KTM yeah. that's great. Now, yeah, no, no, that's great that you guys have Hondas, but it, you know, I serve a higher power. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, hey uh, I have, I actually have a KTM right now, so you know, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've see, had, I've exactly. Had, Prove my y- point. You aren't the only one in the road in the room that's owned multiple bikes. <laughs> we both have owned multiple bikes over the years, so Absolutely. yeah, we we've all dabbled. We've both dabbled in the Yamaha, the Honda, the the KTM, all that stuff. But go I ahead. Think the YZ250 is like the best. The YZ250 is the Harley Davidson of dirt bikes, man. It's the last two stroke. Are they yeah, still make dude, those? They still make those, man. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and it has not changed. Yeah. They put an aluminum frame. I like the Steelys. Why change personally. perfection, right? Yeah. Exactly. The YZ250 <laughs> is like you want a like a all around kick only, <laughs> kick only. Um, now I put starters in everything. Now, yeah. dude, race bikes got starters on them. It's easier, you know. Yeah. Well, they make them so light now. The technology has come so far. Anyway, right. so uh, not to get on another tangent because this is something I did want to say. There was a lot of. Um, just the fall of Japanese cruisers because they were trying to emulate Harley and nobody wins by being a copy, you know? And so they all fell down and there was a lot of motorcycles, that just like ridiculous falls. They're just there cause they just, they didn't support them and they just didn't have the aftermarket support and they were a copy of something They were not original. Now, um, one of the, the first nice bike I ever owned, um, and I've had a lot of shitty bikes, but the first night, and I still buy shitty bikes, but the first nice bike I ever owned was a triumph rocket three. Um, and it was a. I bought it in two thousand eight. I think I remember the it was videos. Two thousand six, and I and I I lusted after that motorcycle, and I didn't even realize why at the time, but later on I did. Is that the Rocket Three? To me, was the same thing as a Honda V sixty five, or a Yamaha V Max. This was a cruiser motorcycle that was all its own, completely original. Yeah. And I like what they have done, like Triumph, especially. And I don't like the company. I think Triumph's a shitty company, um, mostly because of their support of the um, the Gentleman's Ride. It's a very unpopular thing to say. The Gentleman's Ride is not a charity. If you mm. guys didn't know that, it's a I, business. I don't, I don't follow follow it close enough. But yeah, I you're know, aware. I, of I it. know about it. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely aware of it. So you know, I work with charities, right? And mm-hmm. a charity charity work has been a huge. God, I'm all over the place, man. <clears throat> just to finish it, a lot of your manufacturers have made great strides in making cruiser type bikes with their heritage engines. BMW, Triumph, Moto Guzzi. Um, I like that. I think that's really cool. Yeah. These are your engines yep. that you've built that are not the best engine. Like fucking parallel twin, a, a opposed twin. This is not the best engine. V twin, that's not the best engine. Right. But it's their heritage. Yeah. And so I'm they're making it, and I like that. I like that, too. You know, so I the BMW that. R18, yeah. and even before yep. that, BMW actually did before anybody. If you guys remember the Rocker C, what a ridiculous bike. But <laughs> that was a, uh, a true um, example of a company standing on top of its heritage and making a motor and building a cruiser around it. I really like that. Triumph does that. BMW does that. Harley-Davidson has always done that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it just took everyone else a little while to figure it out. Yeah, and some of the Japanese motorcycles are starting to do that. Um, you have motorcycles that are just built around like the Eddie Lawson era, you know, KZs from Kawasaki, and Honda made a throwback CB, and Honda's actually made a few throwbacks over the years, but now they've really had some success with the CB. Uh, I think it's a CB thirteen hundred, um, which is a throwback. Yeah, um, and just it's just, but I mean like. I, I don't know. It's harder for Honda because they always came as something different. So it's harder to be like, this is our engine. I like it for the Trail, trail 125 that I have. I mean, yeah. that's, a, yeah, yeah. that's a throwback. Oh, you you, you have know? one of those? Oh, yeah. yeah dude, I love it, man. I ride it cool. every day. I had a monkey, too. The Honda monkey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, love those yeah. things. Yeah, so I Honda's definitely it. dipping their toes in that yeah. heritage game. They have for a long time, man. Yeah. Uh, for a very long time. But Harley's always been the originator of it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just a lot of people like to talk crap about it, but we're not buying Hyundai Sonatas here. We're buying motorcycles. They want to be like, oh, well, this is the best motorcycle, and this is the best advantage. I'm like, mm, no, I don't care. 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. care, dude. Nobody yeah. cares. Yeah. And, like, the fact that you care is weird to me. But, okay, to each their own, too. Like, I'm not going to bag it, you know, something for everybody. And that's also, like, the adventure bike thing is very much like that. Yeah. You know, like, I want the best of everything. And yep. this is the best. The best specs, the best horsepower. The but best guess suspension. what? What's the top adventure bike? BMW GS. Well, it doesn't have a four-cylinder engine, does it? Mm-hmm. It's got an opposed twin, yep. which is not a great engine configuration. <laughs> they, it's funny. They, <laughs> argue, they argue that those two pistons going out give you better balance. Bull- <laughs> I, I wonder what your is. <laughs> that is not a good engine configuration. No. You know what's a good engine configuration? Africa Twin. Yeah. Parallel, parallel Twin. Parallel twin yeah. I would say that a Parallel t- Twin is probably the best adventure bike configuration because it's um, it's solid. You can keep, the, Small. keep it low. Yeah. yeah. You still Light. have twin cylinders instead of one, which you need for highway stuff. So you got to have mul- a multi-cylinder bike. So yeah. I would say that a Parallel Twin is by far the best design. Mm-hmm. That ain't what B and W got, and they're the top dog. Yeah, they have a they have a heritage design. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've been in that game arguably longer than anybody as well. Um, and now you got guys like Harley Davidson, you know, coming into that realm and competing. But really, uh, man? I mean, fucking, I don't know, dude. Seems to me like Harley Davidson was making bikes that were meant to go off road back in the day, man. They, they, they had all these bikes like the Sportster, they made scramblers and stuff like that back in the day. Well, you know? yeah, and, and certainly Harley Davidson would take your side and, and argue that they've been in the, the off road adventure game <laughs> since yeah. 1903, right? I you know, know, dude. Yeah. They're f- <laughs> the marketing department is just like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to disagree with or agree with anybody on this one, but I mean, let's be honest. Like a modern day proper adventure, adventure touring yeah. bike. Yeah, it's a BMW. GS, it's a BMW. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, it is, and it and it, and and it's a cool bike. It's an amazing bike. I think they're very funny. I like BMWs, so they're odd. It's an odd bike to ride around. They're odd engines. I like yeah. it. It's unique. It's got um, its own character, its own identity. It's, it's own never heritage. really like spoke to me. BMW is yeah. just like it's like simple. Your, yeah. yeah, it's like your grandpa, dude. It's like, yeah. is this what the cool kids are doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like, cool, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like when the R18 came out, which I think is a very cool bike. I rode them. It's got. I love the engine. The bike handles great. It's very cool. They put a lot of thought into a lot of the design features of it. Now. Like, does this bike not feel like a decade too late? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of that novelty, you know, cruiser. They they tried to they tried to make a Harley play. Let's be honest. I mean, they built the bike to compete no, with a soft they, tail or something. But they put a BMW engine in it, which I like. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah, I, I like agree. That. They they did it in yeah. BMW's way. They didn't yeah. try to do a V twin or and something I stupid. That. Yeah, you know, I can I, appreciate that. But too. it's still ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> like it's a ridiculous but i do like i rode one i loved it i would own one it's on my barrel list i'm just not gonna f- pay for one yeah you're gonna you get know? one in 20 years and pay a thousand bucks for oh it. yes <laughs> see that's, way to do it, man. that's why you're yeah. like how do you have so many motorcycles i'm just like because i don't pay over a thousand dollars for any of them yeah that's the way to do it man absolutely Right on, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming out, Josh. I still got more to say. Oh, well, do you? Okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's jump into it. <laughs> what, else, what else can we say? All right, all right. All right, all right. You're, a, you're a Florida man, too. You know, what's up with that whole Florida man thing? You know, out here, it's kind of a joke where it's just like something crazy happens, and it's, oh, Florida man does X, Y, Z. Is there any truth to that? Um, I don't know, man. I've just kind of, my relationship with the laws are weird. Oh, okay. Right? That's a nice way of putting it. So, <laughs> I don't think I'm a bad person, right? I do nice things. I don't think things. you are either. Uh, I would say, I like to say chaotic good, right? And I don't imagine you ever played Dungeons & Dragons. I didn't, know. Uh, I played some video, good, video yeah. games, but Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so, I always like to say I'm chaotic good. Yeah. Uh, so, like, we raised a bunch of money for charity, right? Yeah. I We should, for like, so, I would, in the past year, I raised uh, well over a million dollars for charity myself. Nice. That's awesome. So man. through my channel in one year. That's awesome. So if you look at that, like, dude, fucking people get like awards on the news for way less than that. Yeah. You know, like, why would I? Why did I do it for an award? No, of course not. I'm trying to get in the black on karma. I've been a very bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did it. Is it working? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm still in the red. <laughs> but I'm working. I got years left to go. How many punches yeah. do you have in your car? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I just I don't go out of my way to break the law. I just like I'm not doing anything wrong. Just leave me alone. Um, you live by the spirit of the law. So is what I, I like just to don't say. really think about it. Yeah. And I might come back to bite me. 
at some point. It has once I was on the news once because they did a bunch of weird shit on a motorcycle and they did a it was a slow news week. Slow news weeks <laughs> will fuck you over, dude. <laughs> dude, they fucking put my shit all over ABC action fucking news. Like they were like, Can you believe these people are doing this? I was like <laughs> it is not a good feeling. Did your subscribers go through the, the roof? No, yeah, not uh, at all. I had a news reporter was knocking on my door, right? Uh-huh. Like, with a camera like outside trying to do like an expo i stuck the dogs on her (laughs) but it was like it was stressful right yeah but i doing my thing man like the the bike that i rode here bogan's bike yeah this is kind of a crazy spur of the moment type of a decision to ride across the country on some random guys dude what am i gonna do figure out how to do it legally someone else would (laughs) have though they would have been like well how do i get the right tag and this i'm like yeah I, well, I think we'll end on that note. Appreciate you coming out, Josh, dude. It's yeah, been a pleasure, man. And, um, yeah, I'll be, I look forward to your future videos and checking things out and your future shenanigans and all that stuff. You guys are never short of a couple crazy bike builds and shenanigans over at your neck of the woods. So, I know, uh, man. We're doing all sorts of fun. We're doing, do you like to fish? Oh, uh, yes, I do. I don't do it very often, but, yeah. So that's what we're going to – that's my next thing that I'm going to do, like really lean in hard to is fishing because I love fishing, right? That's cool. So, like Florida, man, everybody fishes, but I love to fish, man. Yeah. So, some fishing videos. So, yeah, we already bought, I bought a boat. Um, right on. And so, we got a boat, and we're going to start doing fishing videos only because I've gotten to the point where I have to make a video to, to do something, which is, I don't hate. I think somebody else could look at that and go, like, oh, there's something wrong with your life. Yeah. But I'm just like, well, f- you, I'm having fun. Yeah. So, like, how are you to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life? Like, I got to make a video to do it. <laughs> this guy's just like an endless pool of content. I can dude. go, dude. That's I why can he. Still do that's it. why he can do two videos every single week because this guy is just like living never content. Run, I never run out of shit yeah. to say, dude. Yeah. Dude, I got an opinion on everything. Yeah, I, everything, I believe that. Man. I believe that. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks again. And Ever guys, tell you about women. No, I think that. Well, I think we'll say that for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, yeah, another podcast. Think, and uh, good luck. Well, you're flying back, right? So I think you should ride back. I think maybe you should cancel yeah, your you got flight. Yeah, you got a bike for me? Maybe we could work that out. Yeah, if I got, you got I, a bike for me, I'll cancel my flight right now. I'll do it. Do okay. Go, well, maybe. Call me out, dude. I know pussy. <laughs> maybe I got to make good on me calling him out. I do a wheelie all the way back on one wheel the entire way back. I'll ride it to the moon and see if it's made out of green cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's made out of spare ribs. <laughs> I'd like to see that. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> Right on, guys. Well, thanks for watching. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the Shade Tree Surgeon, both on his YouTube channel and Instagram as well. What's your Instagram handle? Shade Tree Surgeon. Okay. I knew that, but I didn't want to assume anything. (laughs) All right. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Later. By bringing the entire set to the only way that they'll replace one single 916 socket is if I bring in every single socket from that set. Now the reasoning behind this, instead of just exchanging it for one, I asked, well, can't I just take one socket? It just seems like a waste to replace this whole set. They said, well, well they just said to me, what are we supposed to